I did not want this support. I have not desired it. As I said, I'd rather remain as I am today, common, ordinary, simple savior of America's destiny. A common, ordinary, simple savior of America's destiny. A dreamer who went out to joust windmills and jest the political system, and somehow persuaded millions of Americans to join that dream. We were all dreamers back in the third grade when we first heard about that stately white mansion on the Potomac. That was when we were first told, in America, any boy can grow up to be president. What young man, feeling the heady effects of his election as class treasurer, could resist the secret thoughts of himself gazing out across the East Lawn? Of course, there are constitutional limits on the number of boys who can grow up to be president. But a young man's dreams can't be bothered by such details. And after all, are dreams not the beginning of every great man? Patrick L. Paulson's dream is no ordinary vision. And in spite of his modest claim, Pat Paulson is no ordinary man. Like his heroes of history, his dream of leadership is orchestrated by a distant drummer. Was there a hushed moment when George Washington heard the clarion call of destiny? And are we again at one of those fateful moments when a needy nation cries out for leadership? It is said of destiny that many are called, but few respond. The omen is plain. Like Washington, he must test the waters of leadership. And thus equipped with a grammar school concept and a sense of history, our simple savior sets out on a course to fulfill his destiny. Pat Paulson for president. <laughs> yeah. This tumultuous political year began as the year of the non-candidate. Almost every entertainer was either running for office or denying it, sometimes both. And Patrick L. Paulson followed all the rules of the game. Now, this is completely off the record, and you can answer completely honestly. Now, several people have told me that you're considering running for public office. Now, is this true? No, absolutely not. Well, there's been a lot of talk, and you were involved in uh, public affairs, so I thought perhaps it was true. Oh, well, a great many of my friends and my associates and my fellow Americans have been urging me to run for office. Uh -huh. But what office, I'm not at liberty to say at this time. Uh -huh. Therefore, I wish to state that in, with regard to the presidency of the United States, <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I will not run if nominated. Uh -huh. And um, if I'm elected, I will not serve. <laughs> Then you are definitely not running for public office, right? Definitely not. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm not a presidential candidate. I never have been. Well, that's straight from the horse's mouth, so uh, <laughs> that's, that's sure going to disappoint a lot of people around the country. I appreciate this opportunity so early in my campaign to <laughs> make my position clear. And thank you, Tom. And thank you. Thank you, my fellow Americans. denial of Pat Paulson for president. Speaking for myself, I'm rather, rather sorry that he isn't running <laughs> or climbing for president. I think he'd make a, uh, a, a, make a good president. Non-candidate Paulson left no doubt about any presidential ambitions. Still, there was some question about those Paulson for president clubs that were springing up throughout the country. I have no connection with my clubs throughout the country. Uh, they're nothing more than small groups of un unsolicited, over-enthusiastic supporters of a great man. <laughs> then you actually have nothing to do with these clubs at all. Well, I not only do I have nothing to do with them, I've really tried to uh, uh, dissuade these people from backing me. I've spent large sums of the money, uh, these clubs. I've traveled around the clubs in the various parts of the country. I've met these people face to face, and uh -huh. I've told them that I'm not interested in being president. But still, the questions continued. What does I hear about Cat Paulson running for president? I don't think you heard. A young lady asked, uh, she heard there was a rumor that you were running for the uh, presidency and, uh, in next November, and we thought maybe you could answer the question. Uh, uh, I'm not running for any, any office. This is all hearsay. 
care well, of if, if then you're, you're absolutely not running for an office? No, I'm not running for any office, and I'm not going to run, and I have this to say about the campaign. <laughs> While you're doing that, I wonder if I might uh, stick a bu uh, button on you here. Uh, sure, go right ahead. Running for president, see, and I need all your help. Okay. Here. Who are you going to vote for president? That vote. Well, we're continually expanding the plan. Yeah, I'm more interested in looking at the uh, bumper. Uh, Non-candidate Paulson tirelessly pursued his non-political campaign, appearing wherever and whenever he could find listeners for his denials or a clean bumper for his stickers. Hoods, cougars, cougar yes. hoods. The last two this. cards are loaded with the uh, uh, Mustang hoods, Mustang I see. Sprint. Yeah, uh, spreading out over there, what would be well, over there? Well, you're looking over there towards the end of the assembly line where the cars come out. Uh -huh. Gentlemen, I really appreciated your showing me some nice of here in Detroit. Nice meeting you, Pat. It's been marvelous so far. Our pleasure, Pat. And I uh, want to thank you again. Come so, back and see us really, again. I really have enjoyed you. But you there were skeptics, and Paulson struck back. The radio and press have once again chewed off more than they can bite. <laughs> they continue to confuse personality with politics. They seem to assume that I'm lying when I state that I'm not a candidate for the presidency. <laughs> True, all the present candidates once denied they had any intention of running. But the fact that I am also a liar doesn't make me a candidate. <laughs> If non-candidate Paulson was saddened or disillusioned by this lack of faith in his non-political integrity, he tried hard not to show it. Non-candidate Paulson hits the campaign trail, sparing no expense to establish the image of progressive leadership. If he was still looking for signs, he ignored the helpful advice of the highway department and drove ahead. A candidate looks forward to those first days in the political arena, speaking at every opportunity, his hopes riding on the cry of the crowd. I'm not very good at estimating the size of a throng. I, I couldn't really say whether it was a large throng or just an average one. I, I guess you'd say it was a, a nice throng. You might say that the candidate was greeted by nice throngs during this early stage of the campaign. But some of his followers also came in flocks, and from them he learned a bitter lesson. For some candidates, the birds sing. For a political candidate who really wants to get the feel of the country and its people, there's nothing like the old practice of whistle-stopping. Unfortunately, those who whistle don't always stop. Even during the early campaign, there was a certain charisma about this new public hero which set him apart. The proud lift of his chin, the friendly wave to admiring onlookers, his brave ability to bear up under the terrible loneliness of those who bear the burden of greatness. I think it was Lincoln, Nebraska, where they really started to throw me good. Then it really began to pick up. I hated to lose that personal touch with my followers, but I was starting to get a bit worried about security. CIA agents, many of them still in college, insulated Paulson from his fans. Charting his own air-conditioned campaign plane, Paulson set a course for the state of Washington in a triumphant rally with Governor Evans and the hometown folks. As your president and as a native son, I will be aware of your needs. And believe me, I'm aware of the fact that Washington certainly needs a lot. No, that's not right. <laughs> Let's face it this way. The Depression was over a long time ago for most, most people. Why does the state of Washington have to continue to sell apples?
I have repeatedly warned we must avoid the extremist. Those who say we should pull out our troops in Vietnam immediately, those who say we should escalate and go right into North Vietnam, I tell you we should continue doing like we have been, just messing around. <laughs> 1968 was a year of political surprises, as you all know. President Johnston's decision not to seek re-election was perhaps the, the, the biggest surprise of all. As a keen political observer, I've noticed that most people do not really vote for someone for the presidency as much as they vote against the other candidate. And I think President Johnston's decision was unfair to these people. Asking yourself, is America ready for such dynamic and decisive leadership? I ask you, will I solve our civil rights problems? Will I unite this country and bring it forward? Will I obliterate the national debt? Sure, why not? Thank you. <laughs> By now, it was evident that Patrick L. Paulson had succeeded in converting a third-grade idea into a political reality. The Washington colonists began hearkening back to the start of it all, the facet of his show business career which had originally catapulted him to public prominence. It was his weekly editorials on the Smothers Brothers television show which had provided a showcase for his incisive mind and firm grasp of the national issues. A good many people today feel our present draft laws are unjust. These people are called soldiers. <laughs> and what are the arguments against the draft? We hear it is unfair, immoral, discourages young men from studying, ruins their careers and their lives. Picky, picky, picky. <laughs> now, we don't claim the draft is perfect. And we do have a constructive proposal for a workable alternative. We propose a draft lottery in which the names of all eligible males will be put into a hat and the men will be drafted according to their head sizes. <laughs> the tiny heads will go into the military service and the fat heads will go into government. Paulson had been quick to recognize the censor's value. The time has come to quit around and talk about censorship. We of these Mothers Brothers Comedy Hour have had our share of censorship problems. But we are not against censorship because we realize there is always the danger of something being said. <laughs> Many people feel the censorship is a violation of freedom of speech. Bull feathers. <laughs> Censorship is not unconstitutional. Censors have a right to censor what you hear. The Bill of Rights says nothing about freedom of hearing. <laughs> this, of course, takes a lot of fun out of the freedom of speech. <laughs> Without censorship of television, how else can you, the American public, have the protection you want from vulgar scenes, overexposed bodies, and all the other sights you like to see. <laughs> Let's face it, there have to be some realistic taboos, especially with political comment. After all, the leaders of our country were not elected to be tittered at. Censors have to draw the line somewhere. For instance, we are allowed to say Ronald Reagan is a lousy actor. But we're not allowed to say he's a lousy governor. Which is ridiculous. We know he's a good actor. And you can't say anything bad about President Johnston. Because you shouldn't insult the president. But if you compliment him, who will believe it? <laughs> so you can see that there is a place for censors. And we only wish we could tell you where it is. He attacked delicate subjects. 
the time has come to stop whispering <laughs> about the biggest issue facing our educational system today, an issue which must be discussed boldly, courageously, and in an adult manner. I'm referring, of course, to the whole subject of S-E-X. <laughs> on urban sanitation. I'd like to suggest to the state legislature an amendment, which if passed, will provide for a woman to come in three days a week to clean your city. <laughs> Paulson denounced antiquated divorce laws. Why does a man have to lie about his legal grounds for divorce with all those fancy terms like incompatibility? Why can't a man go into court and calmly say under oath, I hate her guts. <laughs> or a woman say, I hate his guts. Or in the case of a bigamist, I hate their guts. <laughs> Thank you. In staging a drive for the White House, Paulson's growing popularity forced him to adopt advanced campaign techniques. Many political experts have told me that nobody will vote for me because America is not ready for such decisive and dynamic leadership. <laughs> they tell me these things and I say nay to the negative nincompoops who never nourished the nihilistic nerve to name a novice to nail down the nomination. Pat Paulson has brought his campaign to the Sunshine State. Pat, uh, welcome to Jacksonville. I really happen to be here. I really was flying over here looking at it. It's so beautiful. Uh, I really think someday that I'd like to kind of settle down here in Jacksonville. It's just marvelous. Uh, people are so hospitable. Not like uh, people out in California, you know, there's a lot of phonies out there. But uh, here in Jacksonville, these are real people, and this is where I think I'll live someday. I admit I do have some drawbacks and limitations as a candidate. Although I'm a professional comedian, some of my critics maintain that this alone is not enough. <laughs> I cannot deny that I stand before you untested and inexperienced. I only spent two years in television, never as a romantic lead or a song and dance man. <laughs> oh, I'm really glad to be back in Houston. I really dig Texas. Uh, these are the real people here in Texas. These are real people. Uh, it's, they're not like the California people. It's great people. I want to settle down here in Texas someday. I like it very much. My own investigation has revealed to me that it is not the voters who elect the president. The president is actually elected by the Electoral College. I don't want to be elected by any college. <laughs> I want to be elected by the people, for the people, and in spite of the people. <laughs> so remember, we have nothing to fear but fear itself. And, uh, and of course, the boogeyman. <laughs> We're going to ask for some questions, if anybody has any. Little boy wants to know if he thinks I'm going to win. Paulson's bold approach to major issues bewilders even himself. The balance of payments. Well, uh, to get to the meat of, of the matter and kind of uh, get right to the point, I'd like to say that in the final analysis, it escapes me. <laughs> Do I consider myself a better comedian than LBJ? Yes, but I uh, couldn't run the country as funny. What about Vietnam? <laughs> well, uh, Vietnam, definitely, we have a problem there. What about Manifest Destiny? Talk about Manifest Destiny. What's in it for me? <laughs> I'm a member of the Straight Talking Martin Government Party. Stag Party, for short. Sure. <laughs> It's really a pleasure to be here in Santa Rosa at the tra uh, race here. Uh, I got interested in racing uh, from uh, Dick Smothers. He's interested in it, too, and uh, got to meet a very great guy, Andy. Andy and I have been working on this car. I think we've revolutionized the racing business. 
Uh, this car has a jet injection fuel system that's really out of sight, and Andy and I have got it all squared away. Andy, step in here, and this is Andy who's been helping me with the car, and uh, do you think we're going to win it or not? I think we're going to win. That was Andy saying, I think we're going to win. I like the excitement of just, you know, just getting up to speed. The speed is really a thrilling thing to me, and I've learned to control the car and uh, all the moves that are necessary for a guy who uh, is interested in this kind of thing. Also, I get very involved mechanically with what I'm doing, and uh, it's really a thrill just zooming into the old finish line, and I'm looking forward today to showing you what we can do with the car. There he comes down. Into the Left wing or right wing? No, I'm not either. Uh, I, yeah, I'm kind of middle of the bird. No, I'm really excited to be back in New York. It's uh, one of the most exciting towns in the world. This is where I want to settle down. It's not like California, so spread out, and it's the people out there. Not like here. These are real people. This is where I want to settle down. New York is the place. It really is. That's where it's at. Lady on a horse. Why did I decide to run? because I wanted to bring a little charm and brightness into the White House. How do I feel on civil rights? Oh, I, I, uh... I think we should send all the Negroes back to Africa and all the whites back to Europe and start over. Finally, he reached the very pinnacle of national politics, the prestigious National Press Club in Washington. De Gaulle, yes. I think he needs a nose job. Do I have any doubts about being president? No, I think I'd be good for the presidency. I think it's about time we had a little sex appeal. In the Paulson campaign manual, there was no such thing as a special speech for northern cities and another speech for southern cities. Paulson took the trouble to prepare a special speech for every city. which has taken him to just about every state in the union. Welcome back, Pat. Do you plan to campaign here in California now? Well, I think I'll do it all here now. I've had it with the other states. It's really been a drag. I'm very happy to be back in California. These are my kind of people, and uh, this is where I live. These are my people, and I don't want to... Some of the other cities around the country are really awful. I mean, it's unbelievable. No more, no more traveling then? No more traveling. We're going to stay here in California. I don't intend to go outside of California anymore. I don't like, uh, I just didn't have like some of the places I went to. What were the people like in other states? Uh, really squares, you know, real phony squares. But these are real people here. So I'm happy to be back. Thank nice you very much. Good luck to you. To you. Volunteer headquarters sprang up across the land. It was primary night, and the stag party was right in there with a the donkey and the elephant. Backstage, Pat Paulson conferred with political pros. Just curious to know if you would uh, be willing to back I think, I, I, I think uh, you make a great president of Thank the West you. Hollywood Rotary Club. In other words, you're not going to uh, go along with it. I'm going all the way with you for president of the West Hollywood Rotary Club. Well, there you have it, uh, backing from Pierre Salinger in the Hollywood area. Even before the votes were counted, the standard bearer staged a victory celebration for all of his dedicated workers, headed by campaign chairman Tom Smothers. In introducing to you a man who I've been associated with and known for eight years, a great leader, possibility of being the next president of the United States with your support. Let's give a big hand to a true American, Mr. Patrick L. Paulson. Americans, on 
undecided voters. Am I making too much noise up here? <laughs> I would like at this time to issue a victory statement following my highly successful strategy in the state primary elections. There have been 15 of these elections from New Hampshire to California, and in each one I have scored... There had been 15 of these primary elections, and in each one, Pat Paulson had scored at least a moral victory. While the losers fell by the wayside, he had avoided the trap by simply refusing to allow his name to be placed on the ballot. It is time to forget the petty bickering and settle down to an old-fashioned mudsling name-calling campaign. <laughs> here and now, I am hereby publicly challenging all of the other leading candidates to debate on the issues of the campaign. I challenge Ronald Reagan to meet me on his home grounds, the backwater Warner Brothers. And I challenge Herbert Humphrey to debate on his home grounds. I do have some reservations about meeting George Wallace on his home grounds. <laughs> but I'm willing to meet him on a neutral side in Harlem. Closing, I wish to remind you of what I consider the key issue of this campaign. Should we continue to spend billions to subsidize foreign military dictatorships, or should we concentrate on taking better care of the one we have here at home? political columnist wrote, there is growing evidence of public enthusiasm for the Paulson campaign. Of course, the big challenges and the most crucial half of the campaign still lay ahead. Pat Paulson's dazzling primary performance gained him a new nationwide recognition. Now Americans were asking, where did this man of destiny come from? Let's look at another Pat Paulson, quiet, reflective Pat Paulson of an earlier day. We had a ranch back in Washington State. It was a different way of life, slower paced. Well, we had our work. We ran about a hundred head of uh, chicken. Enough that I couldn't say exactly. Getting up at sunup, my brother and I riding out, did you ever try to cut a maverick legern out of a herd? <laughs> Those cowboys had it soft compared to us uh, chicken people. And once you're rounding them up, you had uh, lots of time to yourself. I guess this here uh, was when I first noticed that I had a special talent of handling situations. Things used to happen to me. At first, I thought it was just luck. Things used to kind of fall my way. A lot of people have asked why I started out straight for the presidency. I suppose I could have started at the bottom with a governor's job and worked up. I just got caught up in running for president. When you're caught up in this kind of thing, it's awfully hard to get loose. Besides, it seemed like there was less competition for the presidency than for those governor's jobs. rock-solid Pacific coast of Washington and a uh, uh, rancher with a deeply rooted dream of leadership. Is this where Pat Paulson first heard the call of destiny? I don't think you can actually hear that kind of call. I mean, it isn't as though somebody was yelling at you. Even if they shouted, it would be hard to hear over the herd. <laughs> Thank you. 
We had a big bull, a Rhode Island Red. Used to wander away from the herd. Nobody could understand that chicken. I, I feel kind of like him. I mean, I know many of the folks back home can't understand why I've taken off on my own like this. Destiny is something you feel, like a giant invisible finger that points the way. I guess in lots of ways, I'm like that big bull rooster. Destiny's finger pointed a path for both of us, out of the chicken yard and in, into the White House. I don't mean to say that folks back home don't respect me, they do, but they, they always thought of me as more of a sex symbol rather than a presidential tumor. From the chicken house to the White House, Pat Paulson campaigned tirelessly for unity based on close allegiance with the people of every state he visited. Paulson, how do you think you like your stay here in Denver? Oh, I'm going to love it. I love the air here. It's so clean and fresh. I love the people of Denver. This is my kind of town. I'd like to settle down here someday. It's not like California. It's really bad out there. I like it here very much. The Paulson campaign has emerged from the backwater of whistle stops to the mainstream of American politics. Will Rogers said, I never saw a man I didn't like. Pat Polson said, I never saw a woman I didn't like. Visiting the beautiful state of Ohio, this is where I intend to settle down someday. <laughs> Starting as a sideshow, Pat Paulson's campaign has moved into the center ring of the American political circus. Paulson's campaign cry, We Can't Stand Pat, is heard not only from the galleries, but from legislators. the standard bearer of the stag party carries a heavy responsibility. The task of soliciting votes is easy compared to the job of soliciting money. Like his campaign, Paulson's fundraising schemes were unique. Mm-hmm. 
would you like a, a couple of plain kisses or a, or a fancy one? I'd like a fancy. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Why don't you open the fourth party? Oh, why not? How are party? you? Well, you've got to, uh, you haven't got a quarter, I have, have you? My oh, come on, but, uh, this is a quarter, and we give a kiss. My pleasure. Okay. Oh, just like a plane for an well, old married a, lady. You just want a plane? <laughs> All right. An old married lady, your first strange yeah. man in 22 years. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Just what? a quarter. I want, what? I want a plain one. You want one. a plain one? Well, come on, you can get it. Mm, nice. Thank you. Hello. Oh, that's a plain one. Would you like to go for 50 cents? Go for a dollar. I want a button. A dollar? Oh, you want a button. And, like everybody else who dares to be different, Pat Paulson found hazards in fundraising, especially in California. <laughs> While other candidates stuck to conventional methods of financing their campaigns, Paulson pioneered with his lemonade stands. Oh, yes, sir. We are. This is going to help uh, pay for the campaign. Oh, I'm, uh, I'm just a simple leader? man. There you go, without the lemons. Actually, we figure to pick up uh, about uh, $5 tonight, which is important when I'm on the campaign trail. The lemonade stands brought a lot of criticism from my opponents. They asked how I could charge a nickel for a glass of lemonade. As this type of mudslinging doesn't bother me. I have found that people are willing to pay a little extra for quality. My fundraising projects are based upon the guiding principles set down by President Abraham Lincoln. He said, you can fool some of the people all the time. Thank you very much. Whatever support. Ever alert to new fundraising opportunities, Pat Paulson explores still another avenue. Paulson, I'm selling cookies for my presidential uh, campaign. I wonder if you'd be interested in buying some early a dime. Oh, thank you. We appreciate that campaign. Thank you. I'm selling these uh, Pat Ball for President cookies. I wondered if you'd be No, I'm not interested. Uh, Pat Paulson's inventive fundraising efforts sometimes departed from political tradition. But the high price tag dinner is a staple in every successful candidate's political diet. These stiffly formal, celebrity-studded affairs provide an effective and historically acceptable method of raising campaign money. So Pat Paulson invited some of the biggest names in show business, press and politics, to a formal 89-cent-a-plate cafeteria dinner.
These people are the real fat cats. You know, they're always excited when some big-time political figure is thoughtful enough to let them share the limelight. Mostly, they just want to be seen with him, have their picture taken. These, of course, are not really my kind of people. This is just something you have to put up with. I suppose my reputation for quality cookies and lemonade was getting around. I didn't even invite a lot of these people. They just showed up when they heard I was having a dinner. A lot of them didn't even ask how much it cost. Price doesn't seem to matter to these people. I expect a lot of them won't even vote for me, but that doesn't matter. The important thing is I got their money, and I don't feel bad about taking them. They all got their picture taken with me. Besides, there's not one of them that couldn't have paid $1.29. Here again, fundraising has its hazards. Like other political diners, Pat's friends weren't content to eat and run. Many insisted on praising not only the food, but also the candidate. Any other candidate might have let the praise go to his head, but Pat Paulson modestly refused to allow the praise to interfere with his enjoyment of the dinner. Thus, speaking became the task of such friends as... Steve Allen. Thank you very much, Carl. I noticed these uh, little flags stuck on the dessert. And just so you won't think I'm doing a joke, would you pick up your flag and look at it? On the back of it, it says, Made in Japan. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I think that tells us a lot about the evening, too. <laughs> Thank you, folks. I'm very glad to stand behind this man, Pat Paulson. I wouldn't stand in front of him for a minute. I want you to know that. Because we live in a time when a man with little or no experience, except the theatrical, can aspire to high political office, at least in this state. <laughs> and I think, therefore, he's in keeping with this great California tradition that's uh, beginning to build up. <laughs> Some of you, of course, may not, despite the fun you've had here tonight, you may not be interested in supporting Pat Paulson. You may think there are enough comedians in Washington already, but I say you're wrong. <laughs> we need at least one more. I'm very honored that Pat has asked me to serve as one of his advisors. He has other people who can write jokes for him, but he's interested in my serious views. And he has great attitudes on all the important issues. And that's why I'm very happy to serve on his advisory team. As regards the war on poverty, Pat and I have worked out a plan to shoot about 400 beggars a week. <laughs> right? I think give us a couple of years, we'll wipe them out, isn't it? And when I asked him what he thought about gun control, he said forthrightly, stick him up. <laughs> Be that as it may, and I, I want you to know that every dollar raised here tonight will go to plant a weed in Egypt, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, I, I uh, want to apologize for the fact that I did go on a little longer than I was supposed to, but also the... No, let me explain this. No, no, let me explain this. No, I'm getting to... Oh, you're so dumb. Don't you know a straight line when you hear it? What I... What is that, sir? I just want you to shut up. Thank you, sir. <laughs> that might have been one of the most astute political comments of the day. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the next president of the United States, Mr. Pat Paulson. campaign was steamrolling toward the convention. He won delicate support by his decisive approach to the issues. It's really funny what happens to a delegate when he leaves home. They start drinking and carousing and caucusing as soon as they get to the convention. 
People who never dream of doing it at home will caucus right down in a hotel lobby. <laughs> Some of them two or three times a day. I haven't been caucused once. <laughs> I want to thank the California delegation for inviting me to take part in your caucus. And I'm really looking forward to it after this meeting. <laughs> so I know Jeff Unruh plans to shoot out a gun control bill in California uh, during the next session. But I disagree. I disagree. Without guns, how can we shoot anybody? <laughs> Suppose a man comes home early and finds another man with his wife. What's he supposed to do, poison him? <laughs> and what about suicide? Can you imagine a guy trying to beat himself to death with a stick? <laughs> we need guns. You never can tell when you're walking down the street you'll spot a moose. Besides, guns are not the real problem. The real problem is bullets. <laughs> if I'm elected, I'll see there are plenty of guns for everybody, but we'll lock up all the bullets. <laughs> now, as for the sportsmen who claim that the real thrill in hunting is not in killing animals, but in stalking their prey, we'll make it real interesting. Think of the thrill in sneaking up on a big grizzly with an unloaded gun. <laughs> Ask me about the platform of the stag party. So I'd like to give you some of the issues. As the stag party nominee, I pr propose a simple dollars and cents solution to Vietnam. If you figure the number of enemy casualties and the amount we're spending on the war, you discover that it's costing an average of $600,000 for every Viet Cong. I say we can buy them off cheaper than that. <laughs> I can solve all the world's problems by myself. If I did, I'd have to run as a Republican or a Democrat. <laughs> In troubled and turbulent times as these, the people must seek out a decisive, dynamic, courageous candidate who commands their trust and respect, a man they can have confidence in. And more and more people are turning to me as their confidence man. Are counted on election night, the word will go out to the far corners of the world, proclaiming that Patrick L. Paulson has been swept up in a presidential draft and sucked into the White House. <laughs> so that we do not unduly prolong the suspense, let you, me give you my answer here and now. I accept. Pat Paulson's dream of becoming president has taken him from the streets of New York to the beaches of California, from the conventions of Miami and Chicago to the shacks of Resurrection City. There are those who insist that it's all a joke, but we told you that Pat's dream was no ordinary dream. And in a land marked by political division, even those who laugh must admit that laughter is a better alternative. You know, I've always had this dream. I guess it must sound kind of silly. I've always wanted to be president. A lot of people say I'm not much of a candidate. I do have a tendency to play things up a little bigger than they are. In fact, I embarrass myself sometimes. But I've never tried to embarrass our country. If I ever got to be president, I'd walk right out to that front gate and shake hands with anybody. And if anybody ever needed a friend to talk to, they'd be welcome to drop by any time. Well, that concludes my show, and I'll be getting off now. I don't have a beginning. I'm just going to kind of walk off the stage here, and I'll see you again. I'm going to hang around and make a big thing about it, I know. Uh, so I'll be leaving now. And 
So I think I'll just split and uh, I'm not going to, I'm not going to literally split, I'm not going to come apart or anything like that. I'm just going to leave. I don't, uh, I don't have a big inning. I just leave and there you are. I think it's enough to just say goodbye and walk off. So we'll be, uh, we'll be seeing you then. And thank you.